greet the church in the wonderful name of Allah who come in Jesus Christ. Amen. I greet the church in the wonderful name of Allah who come in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. You look beautiful. Um, to start our program, can we all rise as we sing our theme song, 114? We pray all this in the mighty and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.
I welcome everyone once again. Um, we have a presenter this morning by the name of Ms. Um, it's Dawulile Butelezi Kalonji. He will be doing the public affairs and liberty. To lift her up, we'll ask Bliss to come sing. the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Uh, <coughs> bon, bon Sabbath, uh, Sabbath Tonjema, Sabbath Elise, Sabbath Emunat, Enkle, Dumelang, Sanbonan. I'm just trying to find my coordinates quickly. So, there was a young man who promised to help me with this. Uh, if he can please quickly just step down to assist. So as that's finding its way, my name is Jamli Leptelezi Kalonji and we're already starting off, I have to stand here, we're already starting off um, on limited time, unfortunately, because we started late. So I was initially allocated an hour and a half, but it's okay because we're gonna squeeze everything all into one place as fast as we can and hopefully we can have a little bit of time for Q&A because I'm not certain that we may have this opportunity in the afternoon and I really do want to have a little bit of engagement from what I'll be presenting with, uh, with you guys this morning. So um, as soon as we... Yes. Oh, should I reset? Okay. The whole... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Let's see what happens now. 
That also makes sense. Very good. This mic is clear. Oh, this is not clear? If you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alright, there we go. Sorry about that. So one of the things that I realized anyway is that technology is always a problem. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so we just have to learn to learn to live with something like that. Um, my focus this morning is going to be focusing on PAL, which as we know in our church is Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, which of course is a department within our church from the highest uh, conferences, which is the General Conference, and it obviously cascades all the way down into um, all the local churches from the union, uh, from Division Union and so forth. And I really want us to, before I start on to not focus much on the structure of the church. And I've deliberately structured this presentation in a way that it's more personal to millennials and Gen Zs now. I really do not want to bring the doctrine side of it deliberately so because I want Paul to be meaningful to you. I want you to be able to identify what is it that you can do um, as a young person in this modern day, in this modern age, when it comes to religious liberty and public affairs, where you can find yourself and what your role can be, and also what the role of the church is. And the interesting part is a lot of people think, a lot of young people think, that this has nothing to do with them because it's advocacy work at a very high level, and it sometimes, to some extent, involves politics, and therefore there's nothing I can do. Before I move on to the first slide, I do want to break an ice and kill the, the technology that uh, disappointed us, the mood it brought in, and I do want you to look at the person sitting next to you. Don't worry, I'm not a pastor, so I'm not gonna say neighbor, but just look at the person next to you and ask them, what does freedom mean to you? They don't need to answer you, just ask, what does freedom mean to you? And I see, I see fists already, right? And I love that aspect, considering the, the historical legacy of this weekend. But we will get to that aspect of, of fists up as well eventually. So here's the thing. You've asked somebody what freedom means to them, right? Whether they've answered you or not, what I want you to pencil down in your mind, what the seed I want to plant in your head that's going to help us through this entire presentation is what it takes for you to stand for mission. Without having to unpack what some of the principles of public campus ministry stand for, I'll just highlight one that is fitting for this particular presentation. And it talks about equipping students or young professionals for mission, right? In spreading the gospel, which is essentially the, one of the biggest mandates or the most important mandate, at least that we have. Now, I want you to think about it, though, because we have always taken mission and self as two separate things because for some reason we believe that I cannot preach and I cannot sing because we come from a church where these two things are quite prominent and quite elevated, and it seems like if you don't fit within those two categories, there's not much you can do. But I'm bringing in a different story today. And that story starts off with a biblical mandate. Now, it's me who calls it a biblical mandate. So to pastors who are in this room, please do not judge me. I am not a pastor. I am just a journalist. But I also choose to call it a pillar. And this is found in the book of Galatians 5, verses 1. For those who want to read it, it's very small. It's very quick and short. It says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again right, again, to a yoke of slavery. And that right there underpins the cornerstone of what we'll be focusing on this morning. I want to quickly share my story. It will not be long, but I do want you to look at this picture that's on there. This was 2010, 2011, uh, late 2010. I will not tell you how old I was, but I was young then. Um, and this was in the newsroom. And of course, being say, Nguam I was at work. And don't ask me why they had such old computers at that time. Maybe they didn't have funding, I don't know. But this was the Sunday Times um, Business Day newspaper newsroom, and I was working there as a business reporter. And when I started off as a journalist, one of the questions I asked myself, in fact, the conversation I had with my father was, why do you want to be a slave to stories, running around chasing the camera? There's not much there. But I had to unpack the real reason why I was attracted to journalism. And at the time, with the little I knew at the time, I knew that I wanted to be a voice to the voiceless, which is a lot of things that, uh, something common that many journalists uh, like to share. 
But I also know that I wanted to be able to effectively link my personality, my purpose, which I suppose lucky enough by then at least I had an idea of what it was, link these two things also to me as a Seventh-day Adventist young person at the time. Because from a very early age, I got to understand that it's important to link what you do to what God has capacitated you with. The gifts we have aren't our gifts. It's not our talents. This is why I never really speak about talents. Talents belong to you. You can control them as you wish. You can give them if you want, uh, or you cannot give them. It's your talent. But spiritual gifts interests me because that's not yours. You are a custodian of whatever it is that God has put you in charge of. And this could be your purpose, which perhaps means to serve other people. So I was clear about this at that time. But what I wasn't clear about was what I was going to do in the face of injustice. Because I also had a different character of being shy and being a little timid at the time, but I loved justice. And I knew that I was in the right church and that I did not have to leave the church to serve my career. The second pillar that I had to balance was professional expectations. Very quickly, I will not dwell much on these points. It's an expectation in any marketplace. All of you guys here, some are students, some are young professionals, emerging professionals. And whatever sphere you're in of life or faculty of academia or, or, or workplace, there are expectations, obviously, because some people pay you, you're working, I mean, you're a student, you have to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take situation. You don't just flow through life. And somehow you've got to learn to manage those professional or academic expectations as well, which is something I struggled with because I got stuck there. What helped me, though, was the third pillar, when I got to redefine my purpose. And I really want to quickly talk about the importance of mentors in this instance. I'm a huge advocate of mentorship because, not because I'm a product of one, but because it helps. And why does it help? I truly believe and will continue to believe that mentorship is important for the black population or the black community because we come from spaces that have been very suppressed, spaces that have been very limited in resources, in, uh, in many forms, in space. We've, we've had to really go through you know, uh, spatial uh, segregation and many other things. So the, their idea of less is something that's very, very easy for us to identify with quickly. But when you have somebody who has essentially walked the path that you wish to walk before you, it's always a good idea to just sit at their feet and listen to what they have to say. So redefining my purpose at the time also helped me identify who I was. And then I made a choice and took a decision. And that's what's going to be at the, at the cornerstone of our talk this morning. Your ability to choose. And when you finish that choosing, your boldness to decide. Now, it's very difficult to link these two things in the age of social media. Because with social media, we just go with the wave and the latest hashtag that says, this is uh, the wave or the trend for now. And you really struggle to find yourself in terms of what is it that you have chosen or what is it that you want to stand for. I want you to also put that in your head as we move along. If you can master those two, you can take a stand. Taking a stand is important because you cannot participate or contribute in any form of injustice if you don't know a stand or if you don't have a stand. Because what is it that you stand for? What is it that you're fighting against? This is precisely why there's been a lot of debates about Christian young people, specifically Adventists, where we've been questioned about our fists, uh, sense of activism, uh, of activism, where we've been asked to really redefine what is it that we're standing for. So we, yes, we're marching and we have the fists up, but what's the mandate? And, and when we define that mandate, how is it that we're going about it, not forgetting the actual mandate that we have of the gospel and what we need to preach? A couple of things in our heads right now. I'm just planting a few seeds. Quickly, I call this pins and needles, and I quickly want to share results of those, and it's not a very nice topic. Some people get upset about it, but it is our church, and these are some of the realities that we quickly need to refresh our minds on. I deliberately didn't put all the notes on the slides, because I know people get lost in slides, so I'm very smart, because I knew you guys will not listen to me and look at the slides. So this are just pointers. The first one is how the apartheid legacy and our church has dismally failed in the past to call out discrimination um, or discriminatory or, or an unjust system. 
this is not my opinion. There's a, a number of literature all over the place. It, it didn't really do a good job. And like I said, a lot of people don't like the topic, but it's, it's quite unfortunate. We don't have a good story to tell with how we were able to mitigate influence or even advance the injustice that was happening at the time. If anything, more than, more than not, we facilitated injustice by continuing to uh, internalize and formalize more than one race structures within the very church. And this has left the church and mostly perhaps young people today with questions and a little bit of a blurry lines between the church or I, I don't like to say the church, I like to say my church, because I've always said nobody puts a gun to our head to be here. Like you can be Baptist, they probably even more fun. <laughs> you could be whatever, they've got drums and whatever, you know. But you're here, you're choosing to be Adventist. Nobody's saying be Adventist, this is a choice you took. You got baptized in this church and you are a part of this church. And each time I say your church, it makes sense because it's really yours. So if anything should happen in it, it's gonna have to come from you. But the perception that we have right now, most often when I speak and engage with young people, is how they still are unhappy about this, the suppression that the church has done uh, to freedom of conscience. And this is essentially one of the things that I want to highlight this morning when it comes to public affairs and religious liberty. At the pinnacle of everything else that public affairs and religious liberty talks about, the freedom of conscience is at the heart of why it even exists in the first place. And this is not because it was established by the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 18. I encourage you and invite you to check it out and read it, which gives you the freedom to choose what you feel and what you believe as far as belief is concerned and what you want to affiliate to. And you cascade it down to each and every country. We bring it down to our country. It's also included in the Bill of Rights. So in terms of human rights, we're not gonna get into that. Human rights, it's my right. We know it is. The government has given you that right to choose your own day of worship, at least for now. They haven't yet bothered us about how it is actually not the day of worship, but that's coming. For now, you've got the right to worship and be here and gather without any problems. So these are some of the pins and needles. And the last one I wanna check, I wanna highlight with the pins and needles, and I call them this because it's a bittersweet story, but it's a legacy of our church. And I'm appealing to this particular generation to build better uh, beyond that legacy. The role of the church as well is, as often, more often than not, has been quite significant when it comes to uh, civic uh, and religious groups during apartheid era, not just the Adventist church. So whether the good or the bad that the church did, we've had generally other churches. You look at the history of our country, you'll understand that there's a group of churches who would even host uh, uh, comrades who would uh, hide them when they have the umkhabulo and meetings at night and when police are looking for them. And churches were the hub of all of this, uh, this advancement, this progress, because the, the goal at the time was very clear. We had to free people. We need a democracy and freedom. And that's what uh, was at the core of. So churches have always been at the forefront. So it's not bizarre to bring this to church. This is precisely why I'm hoping this presentation encourages somebody today, at least moving beyond, to be a little bit more bold when it comes to issues of PAL and you not divorcing yourself from them because you feel it doesn't make sense. There is a paper I'd like you to check at your own time. Um, I'll just give you details of the church, it's of the paper. It's a, it was published in the Journal of Contemporary History, and this was a joint paper by Professors Modise and Dube. And in their papers, the paper is titled The Church and Its Contributions to Struggle uh, to Liberate the Free State. I specifically chose this paper because, hey, we're in the free state. Everything has context. Apartheid is not a Soweto story. It's not just a Gauteng province story. It is a South African story. As well as June 16 may have been erupted in Soweto, it's not a Soweto story only. There are young people in Whitbank, in Middleburg, in Mangaung, in uh, Kutsong, in, the, in Kimberley, is it Kutsong, the, the township there, I think. It essentially, it's a South African story. So we also need to move away from, this is not mine, it's these people, because this is precisely what stagnates us to building and driving the change that we wish. But 
as you check out this paper, allow me to quickly highlight two things that I loved about their paper. It's a very long paper, but I just want to pick these two things. The first one, they mentioned that the church was never in agreement on how to tackle apartheid atrocity. So there was never agreement, as much as there isn't agreement now about <laughs> many other things in our church without being political. There's always politics. Everything is political, unfortunately. There was never that consensus. It was never there. And this is precisely why we've had people like some of my mentors, who at the time they were young people and now as leaders in business, they left the church because they felt betrayed by the church and felt that the church couldn't stand and be counted in when it really mattered most. It's okay to speak and share opinions, but when exactly you do that, it's a great deal, especially for young people. The second one is they highlight that um, they... They further advocate in their paper for colonization to be resisted by churches through an emphasis on social justice, equity, emancipation, and common good of all citizens, despite refilious, uh, religious affiliations. And this, again, is part of the fiber that forms public affairs and religious liberty. So, like I said before, the only literature that exists out there is not the literature that says the SDA church didn't do a lot of work or good work when it comes to identifying or fixing certain things. But there is some literature that also helps us understand some of the efforts that we're trying to at least address this. Um, there's a quote I quickly want to share when it comes to freedom of religion, and I love it absolutely, and I always share it all the time. And it's one of the things that was shared by Dr. Diop, who is a PAL director at the General Conference. Of course, his office does amazing work that is directly linked to our church. You also want to check it out and see what they do and just familiarize yourself and see how you can fit in. It doesn't have to be at the high level, but just understand from the top bottom where you can fit in and participate in the church. And I love the fact that he says, without a functioning and active conscious, the sense of right and wrong escapes human re responsibility. This is precisely why Paul essentially advocates for freedom of conscience as a fundamental human right. So before you get to any other rights of you not being allowed to write an exam on Sabbath, you know, those are basics. We've, we really go through this a lot. For years we know, I think maybe our parents may not have had much of that problem, but right now we have young people who are struggling with the Sabbath issue. You've got to attend classes, you need to write an exam. But that's not all PAL is about. PAL is not there to just help you with a letter or um, to assist and advocate for you to not... It's bigger than that. Paul has a principle of mission rooted to it. Don't worry, I won't go through all this. I'll pick a few. I've got about 20 more minutes. Um, I'm going to pick one of the few things that I think are quite important. So the first one, I want you to think of three pillars in your mind right now and think of a position, think of choice and challenge. And this is in relation to PAL fundamentals, and this is essentially in my view. The first one is how PAL as a position militates against discrimination based on differences in belief. And this is at least something we can be clear about of what it stands for. It also goes against criminalization of others based on their difference, and also favors self-determination and respect, um, other, the respect of other people's religious and philosophical choices and identities. As South African young people, I'm not young, but as South Africans, when you talk about discrimination and allowing people space to be, this is not a foreign thought to us because of the historical legacy that we bear as a country, thinking beyond the borders of the church. Now, when you come to the pillar of choice, I prefer or rather urge and propose to bring the word humility. Very simple virtue. Why do I bring the word humility? If you're not humble enough as yourself, as a person, if you're not humble, if there isn't any sense of humility in you, you will not sit down and engage anybody because you're too arrogant in your whatever it is you believe in and you, you are just up there. Nobody can reach you and it's difficult for you to reach anybody else. But I always appeal and push this virtue quite a lot. Because if you look at the biblical mandate that we have as Seventh-day Adventists, you can't help but understand that we have to learn some level of humility because before you even preach anything to anybody, you first have to engage them at their level. And that takes some humility. Something that's very difficult, we even struggle with it amongst ourselves, even within the church. But remember, every day we die to self. So it's not easy. Every day we die to self because it's more of Christ and less of me. 
uh, less of the arrogance, but more of being open to hold space for other possibilities that can help uh, a progressive engagement and dialogue on things that can advance the gospel. I quickly want to say it's a challenge I'm posing to this particular generation and young people in this room. Is a replica of a Mandela Day possible beyond Community Guest Day? I grew up in our church. We had community guest days, and I used to love them because I get to bring my friends to school, I mean to church. Uh, the one time I get to, you know, motivate with letters to their parents that they need to come for a sleepover because we go into church and all of that stuff. Very nice. And it ends there because it's this lovely event where your friends can come to church. But have you seen how the world, and I mean the world, literally the world rallies behind one concept of the 18th of July? There's nothing wrong with that. We're not here to talk about that. But I do want us to pick something from that. Can we, or can this particular generation, is it capable of getting the world, starting with the church, to rally behind a just society? When vet students and many other universities a few years ago had FISMAS fall protests, which was essentially literally global news. We've had young people who would talk about how the church didn't bring them water. Very small thing. Oh no, you know, uh, uh, these philanthropists uh, and uh, celebrities and all of these people were just giving food and bringing water. No, we, we didn't really see our church anyway. We struggled to identify where our church was, but the fees must fall had Adventist students who were talking about being excluded from fees, which by the way, being excluded from fees in, in itself is a problem because that alone is just injustice. It's deliberate. It's, not, it's got nothing to do with finance to some extent. It's a deliberate exclusion of a black child from a system that they should not be a part of. And this is why it will continue to be, you will continue to be excluded because you've got to continuously fight. And this is what I call the plight of blackness. You don't get to, unfortunately, be immune to such because you're Adventist. You still get to register and you're told you can't because you're owing. Then you protest and join because you, you're a black child. Something to think about. Quickly moving on from that, I want to also propose us to think about uh, to extent and measures to which we can embrace models of peaceful coexistence. This is not problematic. Um, in fact, let me leave this slide and quickly go on to one of the things I shared at a conference. It was a, an International Relations Liberty, Religious Liberty Association conference in Miami, Florida. And one of the topics I was given was to talk about models of coexistence from an African perspective. Now, without sharing the whole uh, presentation, I do want to just share this paragraph quickly, and I'll read it as it is. The ability to recognize each other as equally human, to promote tolerance in a tense multiracial culture, the willingness to genuinely look at another and be brave enough to sit across one another despite our diverse cross-cultural chains, and the decision to choose to bring forth the focus of advancing common humanity and helping clan social coercion for the benefit of building a social global sense and respect and coexistence for everyone. All this starts with being willing to care, to hold space for progressive engagement at a most basic human level, to take a second to listen to somebody else, despite political or philosophical differences. This is absolutely pivotal to the efforts that are needed to positively influence the global religious landscape for the sake of peaceful coexistence. My question, as I had posed to my audience at that time, to this particular generation, how far are you willing to go in being a buffer between that dialogue? I'm not going to read all this, because um, I do want to take some questions quickly. But allow me to just say this. The world is in desperate need of a generation that will engage all stakeholders with a transformative ecosystem of peace building and attempt to close certain gaps. Um, of religious intolerance. You look at our continent and you just push beyond South Africa and look at other parts of the African continent, you will realize that in mostly driven, conflict-driven countries in Africa, religious freedom or religious liberty is always put through as a reason for conflict. 
it, it may not be the only reason. We know there's socioeconomic issues in Africa. We know what our plight is as African people. But religion takes the brunt of all of that all the time. Now, it's a narrative, it's a perspective. What are we doing to channel that and challenge it? Because religious liberty may be, it may be to some extent a reason for conflict, but it's not the only one. But is in enough advocacy work being done to challenge that positioning? And I'll leave that to you to answer. I'm happy to share this later for you to, you know, browse through at your time, at your own time, because there's quite a lot. One of the verses that I like and appreciate is how it gives me freedom, literally, it really does. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and it says, now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It reminds me of a text in the book of John that says, where there is love, there's no fear. So you I know there's a lot. We're carrying quite a lot um, on our shoulders, which has nothing to do with us. We just came into the space as black people, and we had a legacy that somehow we had to carry on top of us as well. But to some extent, we've got to be able to break the chain of that legacy and rebuild something new. And I particularly am an advocate of, Carl, uh, of Paul, and I always, always wish and hope that young people can embrace it more for the sake of advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ for this particular church and help us really advance our mandate but to also help us not see it as a tool we can use like an ATM machine when you get stuck somewhere and you know that there's this department that should be writing this letter or doing this, but it's actually a lifestyle. Justice is not an event. It really isn't. There are people who practically live in injustice every day of their lives. The fact that you do not encounter injustice maybe as often, it does not mean it doesn't uh, exist. In fact, it's always very dangerous to be belittling somebody else's struggle because it doesn't affect you. And only speak and start advocating because it touches you now. That's hypocritical. Because I always uh, remember how when we were growing up there was this thing of what would Jesus do? Would Jesus really speak up when it only affects his pocket or because now it's coming to my house? No. Sometimes we've got to be able to channel ourselves to do what's right because it's right, even when circumstances are not favorable. I really do want to say a lot, but I really wish, I know there's no time. That lady was uh, there, I know she's, we, we don't have time, but just five minutes. Any questions or comments? Because I'm not sure how the setup looks like in the afternoon, if we may have any, uh, an opportunity for, for anything. Question, comment, based on what was said, anything that stood out for you. And I hope that through this presentation, you've been able to answer what freedom is to you. Because the, that answer is what helps you redefine your purpose. Whether you're an accountant, or you're studying to be a journalist, or whatever it is that you are, whether you're a medical doctor, it doesn't matter. <laughs> By the way, activism is not for journalists. Activism, social justice, fighting for all this, and advocacy work is not for people who work in media or who can get onto stages and talk loudly or be bold enough, no. When, if you're a human being and you believe that the right things in life should happen, that is enough of a call for you to stand for something that matters. And standing for it means not just standing and speaking or tweeting it out, or, but actually actively being involved and participating in bringing whatever social change may be needed. And I cannot think of any other greater responsibility um, placed upon us, or at least placed upon this generation, than as people who should be carrying that forward. Questions, comments, nothing? We all good? I can close since there's a question. Thank you. Can we share this mic with her? I'm so grateful. Um, to you, Sis Jabu, for this presentation. Um, I, I don't think it's a question. I think it's a comment. I'm, I, I want to say thank you. Um, I think that the church has a model um, through what happened, Kaapar date, to address a really compelling issue that we're facing right now, that society is facing right now. And the church, the Adventist church, is facing it specifically just because of the demographics. Um, I keep saying you cannot be Adventist and xenophobic. Um, and I say that because I don't know how many of us here, I mean, I grew up in a church where 
Ndebele people, um, Shona-speaking people were everywhere. And I didn't know, as, I mean, as a child, Ribatu, you know? Um, but it's so funny to see how years later, the people that we all grew up with all of a sudden carry these biases. And I'm just like, but we grew up with Kuzai, so how are you xenophobic, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, a few, a few years ago, we were at the session and people were crying because they felt the church was silent when they felt they couldn't come to church because they were fearful around the xenophobic attacks. They felt no one cared to even ask, how can we move? Um, what can we do as a church to make your worship experience better? Because we know what's happening in the world and it shouldn't be happening here. And it's heartbreaking to see how we, after apartheid, and I know it's easier for us to, see with apartheid we were all disadvantaged and it was us who look alike. Um, and we all, we all understood, you know, um, the enemy was that person. Now we are the enemy to each other. Um, so I don't know how we can take the lessons that you have taught us. It's not good enough that people have to go to their own churches, go to a Malawian church, and we say that's the answer to, the, to what's going on. It, it's not right that we have a... Um, um, Paki, I mean, okay, maybe Pakistanis because of the language barrier and they want to understand each other. But it's not good enough that we've got Zimbabwean churches and that's the solution to what's happening in society. It is, it's really embarrassing that we can't, beyond coexisting, we can't love one another here in the church with our brothers and sisters that look like us, that are us, and we just continue, and there is no response. Finally, at the same, no, at the session um, afterwards, um, this gentleman brought a letter that the church had decided to write. Um, I think it was an attempt to condemn um, or to address. But the language was just, you know, I mean, I know not all of us work with words, but. It was written in such a way, it was written like it's a them issue. Um, so we are, we, con we condemn what's happening to them. It was just deaf to what's going on in our church and in our society. And I hope that with Paul and with thought leaders like yourself, we'll be able to further develop and move beyond <sighs> the stiffness to what's going on around us, particularly on the xenophobic issue. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, there's something that you said, and it is to speak on how far are we willing to go. And, you know, we, we, we are faced with so much especially when we move out of home or move out of our safe space, with this, which is the local church. And now you start to face the injustice directly. And then you also start to find yourself as an individual and start to find your purpose. And now you start to see the injustice being done directly to you. And we start moving, for instance, with the fees must fall. Now it's, 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 it's in the house and you are now part of religious liberty. You are now fighting for um, the injustice that ha that's happening in the community. And then the church then begins to judge and says, how can an um, Adventist child be part of? And I feel like religious liberty should start and be more meaningful in churches. Because it's more like a program that's we're just ticking a box. We don't go into depth with it within the church space, within the local church space. And that's where we then come in, because right now we are now empowered to now move and say, let's start speaking about these injustices that happen within our communities. 
that will happen to us when we go into varsities. And that's the things that we must start to, to speak on because we, we've got so many ideas and so many things that we want to speak about, but because of the setting and because we are not willing to go that extra mile. So the challenge that you've brought to, to us is that how far are we willing to go with the things that we believe in? There's so many things and so many topics that, that we want to nibble on, but we are not willing to go an extra mile. And, and that's something that we should challenge ourselves. And it starts with an individual to say, me, Ne Asbong, how far do I want to go in order to see the injustice being, being corrected? Right. Yes, it won't happen overnight, and some things are going to go on and on and on, but it's, it's that baby step that we would have in order to correct and, and bring forth um, 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 justice within our, within our communities. And it's going to challenge certain beliefs. That's another thing. When, when you start to face and start to try and re-correct these things, it's going to challenge and going to put a mark behind your back, whereby now, oh, this one is is, is for um, foreigners. This one is for this particular group. But how far, the question is, how far are you willing to go in order to correct what you believe in? Because also belief is, is individual. There's no one else. What you believe in and, and your, when, when you find Jesus, you find him in a particular way. You might find him in a certain calling that is not in line with what, how you grew up. But that is your calling. We were having a conversation yesterday with my friends, and I said, I, I believe fighting for and speaking for, for the marginalized communities um, is, is my calling. And how I got called is, is, is different. And sometimes people will question this. But how far am I willing to go in order to correct what I believe in as an individual? I will be questioned, but I stand for what I believe in. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, teacher. Uh, I, my challenge is one, then I will put my comment. It's now 20, 29 years after apartheid. And in our platforms, when we use apartheid as a reference point, are we not in itself creating a discrimination within the church system? It's, 29 years, people were born, we have children. What have we done as a church for the past three decades? We should be talking now of 2010 maybe, or 2015, not to always use apartheid as a scapegoat. Then my, ch my second point is in terms of education, when my child at preschool is attending a preschool where they go to trips on Sabbath and, and my child is graduating on Sabbath at a preschool and I'm going to attend, it's even announced at church that Elder so and so they are not with us today they've gone to attend a graduation of their five-year daughter. Move fast track to metric. The matriculants are doing it to increase their pass rate. Our matriculants, where I come from, without mentioning the location, I know more than 20 now who are studying meds, preparing for the exam, and it's every Saturday. So before we move to university and college, what are we doing to address the fundamentals from preschool to metric? So I'm, I'm aware of this hand, but I just want to be able to give feedback quickly on the three questions. Um, you know, one of the things I have uh, come to understand and accept in my career is that the role of activism 
is not necessarily so you can plant yourself now and be evil and eat. <laughs> and that's the painful part. Actually, activism is painful in a nutshell. Because whatever it is you're fighting for, you may never, ever in your lifetime even get to see that. I mean, this, the context of this weekend, there's literally nobody here from 1976. But we don't have the issues that 1976 was brought by. They died that year fighting for whatever we're enjoying now. And that, it's a very basic principle of being able to understand that doing right at the right time or the wrong time, if it's right, you do it, as Martin Luther King puts it. It's not for you. And this is the selflessness nature that I personally like, which I believe is a biblical imperative. To some extent, a moral imperative, right? Some could say it's a human rights imperative, depending on whatever perspective, is that you are always in a position to do right. And whatever it is that you're fighting for now or standing up for now, you may be misunderstood, you may be called names. And I mean, really, without offending anybody, we be pretty good with that in our particular church. We really take the cup in bringing each other down, but God is still working on us with that one. Um, but quickly moving on to also some of the aspects that Komoto brought up, just in passing, we will not discuss xenophobia now because that we need a, another Congress, we need a xenophobic Congress to really talk about that because it comes from a socioeconomic element which is very, coming from very dire circumstances that literally you know, move across a pan-African landscape that are some, to some extent even beyond us. But the question she raises is very important. Why is it so difficult to just tackle it in the church though? Because the minute we walk in that door, what's the goal of fellowship? What's the expectation of Christ when fellowship is concerned? So why is there even that animosity in a, in a space like that? Because then this brings a problem of us wanting to unpack the idea of fellowship. What does fellowship actually mean? When the scripture says you will know them, not because they host great congresses and because they always on point with heels and hairstyles, no, but you will know them when they love one another. So when they love one another, you won't have to ask, you will know that no, it's, it's them. It's a journey, right? Something to think about. The, the gentleman on, you know, at the back, you raise very important questions, and this is precisely why I always say, every, the beauty, at least in my view, I think, of our church and its department is how every department, I think, links to every other. But we do not take the interest to appreciate that. Public campus ministry, which is an institution or rather a part of the body, I do much of the work in with young people practically literally across the globe, is one of the elements and the tools of vehicles that can address that. This is precisely why I said, I'm not even going to come here and talk about writing letters on a Sabbath. That is, it's not a small thing, but that's not what, we've been brought up to think PAL is all about that. What advocacy work are we doing from primary level school? This is what he's asking. It's 29 years later. The, uh, the, the idea or the, the thought uh, or concept of saying we use apartheid as a scapegoat is painful to some. Some people feel this was a crime against humanity. So we will relate and use it the way we want to because we actually are the subject of that, that thing. It was painful and to this day we cannot even infiltrate certain systems because systematically injustice and apartheid has continued to exclude us. So it's a bit, you know, from a perspective point of view, again, that, that could be quite painful and deep. But think of it just humbly. What have we done? Yes, we know that race relations are also not a very easy thing to talk about. But surely church should be the most safest platform to engage. Not decide, legislate, just engage. And this is what, in fact, that banner even reminds us. It's one of the pillars of public campus ministry. You empathize, you engage, you empower. You can never engage without that humility if you do not engage. And this is why I'm saying, do we have that kind of generation that will rally behind engaging all stakeholders, have that interfaith dialogue, cut beyond the cross-cultural chain, and engage? And from engaging, see what is it that you can do. Because it's very, very painful to be able to ask ourselves why we're not making any significant impact at primary school. We still have a bigger problem. We don't have hospitals and schools, actual schools. So 
can you see how many problems we have? We haven't uh, established any footprint or foundation to assist Gen Zs to not attend a math lesson on Sabbath. And we have a few colleges because every, this is precisely why everybody else goes to study somewhere else. Topic for another day. Can we take another comment? How am I doing with time? Can I stretch it for five more minutes? Who? Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so um, I think it's more of a question from my side, right? Uh, when you started, you, you mentioned that when you were choosing your career path, um, you basically wanted to link it to the mission. Now, um, the first question is how do we link our career paths to the mission. Um, I'm, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking about the disciples. Jesus calls them in their various career paths and he tells them <laughs> to leave whatever they were doing, fishermen, tax collectors, uh, to come follow him to do the mission, right? So, yeah, that, that, that's the first question. How do we link our career paths uh, to the mission? And the second mission is, um, I think being able to link the career path means that you're able to make a choice of your, you, rather, you're able to make a career choice, right? Uh, and what I've picked up in the current economic state, there's very few people who are sitting here, who are in the career paths that they, were, they, they wanted to choose. Most people are in career paths that they could uh, qualify to be in so that they can get to the bread as quickly as possible. How do we balance out that choosing, linking, and allegiance to the bread? I absolutely love your question. It's a very, very important question because it, it's, a, it's a replica again and a precursor to the plight of blackness. We do not have the luxury of choosing whatever we feel. <laughs> what I'm passionate about this. That you in matric and uh, you asked, what do you want to study? There's a trust fund ready for you. We don't talk that language. I mean, you need to immediately when you get to grade 11 be able to put one and one together and be able to be clear about how you're going to contribute to ensuring your parents don't lose a house and how you may even get through that academic uh, journey with as limit of them being required to pay if you can get a scholarship uh, you know whatever if somebody else can help you out right because our parents not all of them at least are not in a position to just take you through varsity I will tell you one thing, though, and, and by the way, the answer I'm going to give is, is not an absolute answer, but it's a, at least a means to maybe position a different alternative, or at least what helped me. When I didn't just become a journalist, I started off studying civil engineering, <laughs> strange enough, and I, I specifically took civil engineering because at the time I had, a, I had an uncle who was a mining engineer who uh, used to work in the mines in Klagsdorp in the Northwest. And he told me, this is many years ago, he said to me, you're a black young woman. <laughs> you are going to drive the biggest car ever. Like, we're talking serious kitchen. Like, just do this thing. I will help you. And I had to keep on imagining myself with that hat inside of mine. I mean, first of all, I am claustrophobic. And I went through, I went through school. I, I did. I did. I passed my engineering maths. Used to carry the T-square thing. I, it, funny enough, I even did so well with engineering drawing. I passed. I did not fail. But I was so depressed. <laughs> I was so depressed, not because I didn't want the money. I mean, I wanted the money because, hey, I mean, if I can cut beyond this norm of limitness, right? But at some point, you need to talk to God about your career. Because we have, a, we have this understanding that God is a God of big things, a God who pays school fees so you can enter. But he's not a God of a small thing like, what have you built in me that I'm supposed to be using to eat from and also glorify you. Because the very fact that he has brought you up and raised you up 
for such a time as this as a young person in this particular generation, I mean, surely there's something you can do. But what is that thing? And if you can do that thing, can you eat from that thing? And I'm not talking small things like spaza shops, please. That's also one thing that completely depresses me. Each time young people talk about empowerment, they talk about owning a puzzle. No, you cannot. Unless you're talking about only a consortium of spaza shops. Now we're talking. This thing of wanting to say, Manga Tolanje, Ikonanje, Fagita Flalame Konin, Naminjeng, you cannot. I know that there's a, the situations are dire, but this is why we need to push harder because I'm sorry to say that. But again, really, with all innocence and all the Sabbath spirit in me at this point, I will say um, the white race in most schools, there's discipline in those schools. And for some reason, where black kids go to school, we encourage all sorts of democracies and freedom. But the truth of the matter is you ask yourself, when you get to Anglo-American and you get to BHB Pillerton and all these big places, what are the chances of a CEO being a candidate that came from the other side? Where are you most likely to find a subordinate and what color will that subordinate be? Of course, with the people who are leading us at this point in our country, there's different nuances, anything is possible, really. But it's a fundamental question. So why is it that we do not align to the notion of discipline as a vehicle to helping us build the character that LNG White, I don't, you know, trying to be smart quoting her, but she does uh, mention something very profound about how don't worry about reputation. People can kill that and break that every day of your life, but character is really what should give you sleepless nights because that comes from God, and God sustains it. He just doesn't give it, but he sustains it too. So you worry about your character, and what builds character? And who wants people with well-molded characters? I want friends like that. I'll even put my money in with people who resemble something like that. Something to think about. So I would really encourage you to not just pray about it, because also that's very, you know, up there. <laughs> I don't like solutions like that. I mentioned mentorship earlier, and that's what helped me. I did that. I went and I wrote an email. I remember even after I had chosen my career, I still wasn't sure. I wrote to the CEO of Telcom, and I said, firstly, I tried to get through the PA. It took me four months. He was busy, he was busy. Somehow I got his mail and I just emailed directly, broke protocol, and I just like, by faith, if, that's, if by faith some things can work, by faith this protocol can be allowed to break. This is who I am. Can you assist me on a business career journey? This is what I want to do. He responded and said, thank you for your mail. Please tell me where you are. Um, what do you want to, what, what's your short-term and long-term goals? What have you done so far? Show me your profile. And I have never been through such a stringent mentorship Jenny. At some point I was like, maybe I shouldn't have chosen him. But he kept me accountable to what I had told him I wanted to be and what I wanted to reach. And as I was going through that journey, automatically God was enlightening me about, Jablile, this is who you are. Jablile, this is what I want you to do. These are your passions, but some of your passions, yeah, you will starve. So don't follow the passions only now. We, I mean, you got to balance. You are black. You need to eat. <laughs> It's a constant balancing act, and it's not easy. But I think you need, we shouldn't take it with so much, uh, uh, take it as a burden so much. Also, let's just trust God with that process. Reach out to the right people, a mentor in church, a coach, whatever. These things are not um, far-fetched. Please don't belittle them, you know. Give them a chance. Try and find somebody who can be a spiritual brother, a spiritual sister. Find spiritual parents who can advise you on what you can do, give you ideas. Just don't tell the wrong people ideas because some people steal anyway. But yeah, and they're still children of God, but they steal. So the best person you can uh, talk to is God, is God. And I think he, he does have a way of showing you what you can do. He does it with navigating you through certain things. Sometimes you fail, you get off the bench for years or months. And one day he just brings something that fits exactly into who you are and what you need to do. But you've got to stay connected to him like the grape to the vine. You know that text in the Bible? Because that's, you've got to be able to be sensitive to 
the precepts of the Holy Spirit as well. And we take that for granted as young people because we think, I don't know how we'll hear God, maybe by Bluetooth or what, I don't know. But you need that relationship. It's important because this is how God relates to you and reveals to you what needs to happen. Okay, we close it? Okay, thank you so much. In closing, we'll ask Bliss to render us with an item. Kosi eku segi swa owa muku nenga giza uku lega. everyone is blessed. A quick announcement. Um, the owner of the vehicle JW31CFGP is required to come to the door. Thank you.
Number 67.
San Bonan. I, I take this time to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, um, my task is pretty simple. My task is pretty simple. I'm, I'm only here to ask that we take a moment in prayer. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to share a passage of scripture with you guys found in the book of First Chronicles. Um, one of my favorite stories, a pretty short story, two lines, and uh, we are introduced to a character called Jabez. Uh, Jabez approaches God in a prayer and he says, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. May your hand be upon me that you may keep me from causing pain. Um, just a, I hope, I'm not preaching, I'm not preaching, so I just want to share a bit of of what I learned at school. Um, <clears throat> so Jabez approaches God in prayer and he says, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory that I might not cause pain. What is interesting to note about Jabez is that his entire life story is summed up in but two verses. His entire life story is summed up in only two verses, in two lines. And throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that's the only thing we ever hear about Jabez. His prayer to God, which says, oh, that you may bless me and enlarge my territory. May your hand be upon me that you might keep me from causing pain. So Jabez is named in Hebrew. His name in Hebrew simply means caused of pain. And, and his mother caused, called him Jabez because he, she bore him out of pain. And so Jabez's prayer is not to live up to his name, not to cause pain. And, and it is interesting to note that in the Hebrew culture, uh, a son is normally given the name by the father. When the son is only eight days old, then the son is named by the father. But this time, Jabez is named by his mother, which is traditionally incorrect. And he's named Jabez from the experience of the mother. And, and I've been asked that we come and pray, and I'm simply going to ask that as we take a moment in prayer, I want us to consider the, the destiny that many of us have been set out for. I want us to consider the future that many of us hope for. And I want to pray that we all come up to be, not necessarily what we were supposed to be, but what we were intended to be by God. Are we together? So I'm, not going, to, I'm going to ask that we, at this moment, do not divide into groups. However, I'm going to ask that if you have a prayer request, irregardless of what it might be, if you can only join me as we pray at this moment, please. Join me as we stand in prayer. Let's pray. We give thanks to thee, most holy Father, for your love and for your goodness towards us. For we do not know what could have been of us, yet you have stayed faithful to the covenant you've made with man in the day of old, and for that we are grateful. Our God, you know the pains that we face in life, dear Lord. You know the criticism that we've encountered. You know our ills, and you know our state in life, dear Lord. But one thing that stays true is that indeed you are God and you hear our prayers. We pray at this moment, dear Lord, you be with each one of us who have gathered here in this house, dear Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to tabernacle and fellowship with us, dear Lord. May it lead us, may it guide us, and may it keep us at all times, dear Lord. Continue being God in our lives, and continue affording us the privilege to be called your, your children. In Jesus' name we have prayed, amen.
We'd like to ask Noted to render us a special item.
Number two one six. And after this song, we'd like to ask God's grace to give us a special item.
quick show in the one of the name of our say just Christ, amen. So I'm just going to say one announcement, then we carrying on with the vibe. Can all the pastors please go outside? Um, yeah, you've been asked to meet. If you know that you're a pastor, please um, go outside. Um, we will not be looking at the intention to, to this end of the program that is coming. But in our meeting for the opportunity, 
from Chicago was confirmed. Patricia Fulani, um, who was it fit to come and be with us today. And we, we just want to say we, we feel honored that you have decided. to grace us with your, with your presence. Um, I just want to check if we are here alone. Okay, uh, today he decided to, to be alone. We, we, we want to say we are so grateful without wasting any you are so predictable. I predicted that that is exactly what you are going to do. So predictable. Amen. Um, this is so beautiful to see all of you here for this Youth Congress. And we pride ourselves with your, with your being. Uh, you are not the future church, by the way. You are the church now. And it is our duty as well and our obligation to make sure that your voice as young people is not muted and that your space within the church is fully occupied. Uh, and if you were to look at all the revolutions that ever happened, they were all initiated and done within the first 35 years. Life happens from zero to 35. And you have that opportunity. And please make sure that you make the best out of it. Because it's not a permanent privilege it comes and it passes. I will not be wearying you with so much. My job is just to greet you. But one of the wisest men who ever lived, speaking about this youthful age, says, in the morning, which is morning of your life, this is just metaphorical, morning, noontime, and evening, 
referring to the phases of life. So if you are youth, you are in your morning. In the morning, sow your seed. In other words, you are so fruitful, you do have the seed. And the best time for you to sow it is in the morning. And we also know that the 6 billion population that we have, about 7 billion that we have, it has been mothered and fathered by young people. Amen. In the morning sow your seed. This is from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6. And in the evening do not withhold your hand. And in verse 9, rejoice, O young man, stroke woman, in your youth. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart. And in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all this, God will bring you into judgments. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. In other words, they are not enduring, they are not permanent. They come and they pass. Put away evil from your flesh because if you don't, there is nothing as miserable as being an evil old man and an evil old woman. So what you sow in your youth you also reap in your old age or in the evening. And Ellen G. White also speaking about the young people. She says, let the habit of self-control be early established. Let the youth be impressed with the thought that they are to be masters and not slaves. Of the kingdom within them, God has made them rulers, and they are to exercise their heaven-appointed kingship and queenship. When such instruction is faithfully given, the results will, be ex will extend far beyond the youth themselves. Influences will reach out that will save thousands of men and women who are on the very brink of ruin. This comes from the book Education, page 203. And Christ himself also talking about young people in the book of Matthew 6, 33, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. The big message and the very subliminal message being stated here is that uh, when you are young, choosing God in your youthful years does not make you to miss life. But if anything, the Bible says, choose Christ first in your youthful days and all the things that people go after will be added to you. And those who go for the things that you get as an addition, they end up missing, not just missing life, but missing Christ. Now, to miss Christ in your youthful years is the most tragic tragedy that can ever happen. Because then you live life with Christ missing in your life. And if you miss Christ, do you know what happened at the end? You get missing. Missing here on earth, and you will also get missing in heaven. So get Christ now, and then all the other things that the world go after will be added unto you. So with Christ, you miss nothing on earth, and you also don't go missing yourself. So may God bless you so much.
let us not be missing in church, be missing in life, be missing in heaven by missing Christ. Amen. And thank you so much, Pastor Maichu, for bringing up the whole conference in the faces and the hearts of these young people. May God bless you so much. Amen. Yo, one. Uh, we'd like to please ask Isenzi to come and... Se 
Christ as we pray. Kind and loving Father, we solicit your presence as we are about to commence this program. May your Holy Spirit hover around this room. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, I take this time to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Um, at this moment, can we, can we have the praise team as we do our, our theme song, please? Yes, can we, can we all rise as we sing our theme song? Christ. Amen. Amen. Can you just turn to the person sitting next to you, tell him or her to move, and give that person a smile.
Hallelujah. You know, a famous story is told. A famous story is told. But before I tell the story, uh, turn to the book of John 3, verse 16. I know you don't need to turn there because it's a famous text. But for those who are not familiar with the text, please, let's go to John 3. But before we read John 3, a famous story is told. One man was praying, and he, was, and he said, uh, God, please bless me with a job. And he said, to, if you can bless me with a job, I will return the first tithe. But I will not stop there. I will also return the second tithe, and also I will return the third tithe. But because God can see the future clearer than we can see the present, he sees this man in the future having this job and not returning a single tithe. And God said to the angels, give this man a job. And the angels were like, why are you giving him a job? Because you know very well that he will not even return a single tithe. God said, no, give him the job because I'm not like them. I don't play tit for tat. I remain faithful even when they are not. That's the God we serve. His faithfulness does not bank on our faithfulness. Then John says, for God so loved the world. You know, uh, if you need, let, let, we need to unpack this text in the language of John. Because English follows what we call a word order. Uh, word, word order, we, I mean by you need to start a sentence with a subject followed by a verb. That's a word order. But the language of, Don, of John does not focus on that pattern. But it, it, it begins with what it wants to emphasize. So if the object is what, what the person wants to emphasize, he will start the sentence with the object. So when you read the book of uh, the chapter, or the, the verse John 3, 16, you'll understand something that the emphasis of John is not the everlasting life. Hello? The, em the emphasis of John is neither even the begotten son, but the emphasis of John is the love of God. John says when the love of God was exposed, it gave birth to the begotten son. And everlasting life. Because it's easy to think God loves us because he died for us. But his death was not the reason to love. But his death was an act of love. So John is saying, we have this hope because someone loved. Because you can't love and do nothing. So as you are about to bring forth your offering, ask yourself this question. What precedes my offering? Am I giving because I have? Or am I giving because I'm motivated or influenced by love? But if your giving is not motivated by love, it's not worth it. Keep it to yourself. Let's kneel down for prayer. I don't know if you'll be able to kneel, but let's bow our heads. I don't think we'll be able to kneel. Let's just bow our heads for prayer. We're asking ourselves this question, what precedes my giving? Sometimes we give because we expect something in return. But if our giving is preceded by love, love expects nothing in return. Help us, oh Lord. What is funny now? As this slowly sees before Snigela, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. While we are taking the offertory, um, we're going to call on God's grace to please bless us with an item. Jesus, young Gihola, Gesan, Gasak, Song, 
pray, let us consider a common text, Judges chapter 16 verses 28. It says, then Samson called unto the Lord. Some vision says Samson prayed unto the Lord. This is the prayer. Oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this one time. Oh God, let me avenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. This is a, a very selfish prayer because Samson is praying for revenge. Some scholars said Samson was without sight up until he lost sight to have sight. And then he says, please remember me for my two eyes. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with his purpose. But it has everything to do with him, what has happened to him, or what he has allowed it to happen to him. For my two eyes. According to the Nazareth laws, Samson broke three of them. The one that were given to the parents, it was that he must not take strong drinks. 
he must not touch any thing that is unclean and he must not cut his hair. But Samson, we heard yesterday, he didn't even touch the carcass, but he, he tasted it and then he brought it for others. And then some scholars believe that in the marriage feast that he had, he also tasted wine because it was a custom of the time that before others can partake of the wine, as the one who is getting married, you must taste the wine. And the account was, do not take any strong drinks. And then the last one is that, do not cut your hair. And then he cut them all. Here is the power of the text. Samson, knowing that he has broken all the laws, knowing that there is no connection anymore, but he was relentless to believe that there is a God who does not need a SIM card. There is a God who doesn't need a, a Wi-Fi connection. But without connection, if you have faith in him and you believe that the God who hears prayers, if God will, he will come to your refuge in time. I want to say that without connection, if you pray to God in faith, he will have your heart desires. The Bible says that this is always with us. There was a young boy who was always with him, and some of made a request to take him to pillars. The ministers were here, they asked us just to get us closer to pillars. And then we learned that they were disciples. Some of us not victorious because his hair was growing. Some of us were victorious because he believed that if Christ would go, he was going to answer prayer. At this time, I just pray. I don't know where we've been, I don't know where we've been from here. But there is a God. You made a lost condition. But this God is interested in you. Before you were formed, you have a pre nice purpose. And it is such a God. And in Him, we live. Without Him, we are nothing. I want us to pray. And our prayer is Lord, we've gone too far. Please bring us back home. We don't want to go back to the same. We refuse to go back to the same. But as we leave this place, let us be better citizens for heaven. Let us be earthly, useful way. And then to one another. We shall pause for a moment of prayer. Babotuna Mar, Jovon Bele, the mighty Tosi youth, we bring closer to you in a special way. We have signed to more men, we have entrusted them to speak away. We pray in a special way that the Lord may cover. Your ministers are here to ensure that they show where Jesus Christ. On our own, we cannot wait. But you in us, we can fulfill the mission. In a special way, the Lord, now we are about. You are a faithful God. We call upon you because you have never disappointed us. We ask in a special way, dear Lord, that we don't leave this place the same. Heavenly Father, send the Lomus and Gos. Siak Telangosi, Ugutu and Upagame, 
bese sonke siyehla ujehova sazophakamiswa kule ndawo sicelo umkhona bakho sikhuza yonke imimoya yejehova longleyo that can be here to cause destruction sicela ukuthi kubuse wena ingilozi